Welcome back scholars. This video is mostly about the applications of intermolecular forces. And one of the big things we can look at for intermolecular forces is solubility. In other words, what will dissolve and what? And when we think about solubility, we need to define a few terms. So the solute is the component of the solution that's present in the smallest number of moles. This is the thing that's being dissolved into the solvent. The solvent is the component of the solution that is present in the largest number of moles. This is the thing that is dissolving the solute. Solubility is a measure of um, how much of the solute can dissolve in the solvent. This is normally given as, say, grams per milliliter or grams per liter. And miscible is a term used to refer to two liquids that can mix with each other in any proportion. So either one could be considered the solute if it's present in the smaller number, and the other one could be considered the solute if it was present in the smallest number of moles. And you can mix them in any proportion. So this is things like methanol in water, acetone in water, ethanol in water, um, those kinds of mixtures. We also have other kinds of attractions now that can occur between compounds and liquids. So if you have an ionic compound that is made of ions of alternating charges, and if you have a solvent that is polar, it has a dipole, and the dipole from the solvent can interact with the ions in the ionic compound, and positive and negative will be attracted. So ion dipole is an additional kind of intermolecular force that we typically see in solutions. And sphere of hydration is a particular term used for when water molecules are surrounding an ion in aqueous medium. And if it's a solvent other than water, then you call this the sphere of solvation. And so for instance, for something to dissolve in water like an ionic compound, here's a picture of sodium chloride that sodium chloride is consisting of positive and negative ions. Those positive ions are attracted to the oxygens on the water, and the negative chlorides are attracted to the hydrogens in the water. This attraction causes the water molecules closest to the ion to become arranged in a particular way. That group of water molecules is referred to as the inner sphere of hydration, because that first ring of water molecules is so organized and they're oriented in a particular direction, the next ring of the water molecules also starts to become oriented a little bit towards the positive ions, and that's called the outer sphere of hydration. And then that third ring really is, has lost any type of order resulting from the ion, and that then is just behaving like the rest of the system, the rest of the solvent, and we would call that bulk water. Between the ion and the water, we have the ion dipole interactions. Those are the green dashed lines, and then the blue dashed lines are representing the dipole dipole interactions between all of the neighboring water molecules. And this ability to dissolve things really depends on how similar the intermolecular forces are to each other. So this is where the phrase like dissolves like comes from. And really what it means is that you're trying to look at your molecules, ions, compounds, and you're trying to see if they have similar intermolecular forces. So ionic and polar solutes would be soluble in polar solvents. Nonpolar solutes would be soluble in nonpolar solvents. Molecules that can form hydrogen bonds will be more soluble in solvents that can accept and donate hydrogen bonds. And so we can look at, say, water and octane. These are two very different kinds of liquids. Water is a small molecule and it's polar. Octane is a relatively large molecule compared to what we've been looking at in chemistry so far, and it's nonpolar. Both are liquids at room temperature, okay? Both of them on their own have similar forces, similar intermolecular forces to the other molecules. So the octane molecules are all attracted because they have similar forces. But if we mix these two, 
If they have like forces, they will form a solution. But when we mix these two, we actually see a layer form. The octane is on top of the water because the octane is less dense than the water. But the octane is only able to form dispersion forces for its intermolecular forces, whereas the water has dipole-dipole and also hydrogen bonding. But because the water it has hydrogen bonding and dipole-dipole, it doesn't really have a good way of interacting with the octane. The water does still have um, dispersion forces, but remember water is a small molecule, it's only got three atoms, and those dispersion forces are gonna be so weak compared to the dispersion forces in the octane that the octane's gonna rather stick together with other octane molecules than it would want to associate with the water. So when we have more than one intermolecular force going on, we need to think about both when we're thinking about solubility. And so all the molecules in this chart, they're all called ketones. They all have a carbon with a double bond to an oxygen. And all of these ketones, therefore, are gonna have about the same strength for their dipoles on that end where the ketone is. But notice the right side of these molecules is growing. In the two propanone, the ketone is on that second carbon, that's why that two is there, because it's propanone, it's got three carbons. But that end that's on the other side of the ketone is gonna grow. So the two butanone is still on the second carbon, but past that, there's two carbons now instead of just one. And the two pentanone, the ketone is still on the second carbon, which means there's three more carbons past that, and so on. We see for all of these molecules that the solubility of these ketones in water goes down. Remember, miscible means that it's completely mixable in any proportion. So we could put one drop of water into the two propanone and it would completely mix. Because that solubility goes down from miscible to about 25 grams per 100 milliliters to about four grams per 100 milliliters and it keeps going down, what this tells us is that these intermolecular forces are changing in the ketones compared to the water. There's something in the ketones that's becoming more unlike the water or less like the water as these molecules grow. And so the important thing to remember here is that even though the ketones can still accept hydrogen bonds from the water, even though they still have dipoles, because the one part of that molecule is getting larger and larger and larger, the dispersion forces are actually increasing. And when the dispersion forces increase, those two heptanone molecules are going to rather stay close to other two heptanone molecules where they can have dipole-dipole and dispersion forces keeping them together rather than going into the water where the only thing they would have going for them is a little bit of dipole, dipole, and some hydrogen bonding, but that long end of that hydrocarbon chain is gonna have only dispersion forces and nothing in the water for it to interact with. So then we can look at octanol. Octanol is kind of a combination of these. It's kind of like these ketones. It's typically a lot easier to work with in the lab. And the octanol has a hydrocarbon chain where the dispersion forces are strong. And it has that alcohol end where the dipole-dipole and the hydrogen bonding is strong. And so if you think back to biology, what did we call these two sides of this molecule? We called them hydrophobic and hydrophilic because the one part did not want to interact with water and the other part did. So thinking about this octanol, which has hydrophobic and a hydrophilic end versus water, which is water itself, so of course it's hydrophilic, which of these is gonna dissolve more of the solute? Is sodium chloride gonna be more soluble in water or octanol? The sodium chloride is more soluble in water. We can get six moles of sodium chloride to dissolve in one liter of water whereas we can only get about 0.2 moles of sodium chloride to dissolve in one liter of octanol. How about glucose? Well, now glucose is a larger molecule, 
And so it's predicted that we would saw, actually dissolve more glucose in octanol than in water. What about oxalic acid? Again, it's predicted that more of this would dissolve in octanol than in water. One of the reasons why is because the oxalic acid is molecular, it is covalent. It, even though it's an acid, it does not react completely with the water to generate protons and oxalate ions. And so it stays neutral, which actually makes it harder to dissolve in the water. It makes it less hydrophilic. And so the octanol, which is able to both accept and form hydrogen bonds, but also has dispersion forces, is really good for the oxalic acid. What about um, hy calcium hydroxyapatite? This is, in fact, the mineral that forms bone. And while a very, very small amount can dissolve in water, there's really not that much that dissolves in water, which is a good thing. Otherwise, our bones would just dissolve away. So I hope this helped you figure out a few things. If you um, want to think about a few more, you could think about why does acetone dissolve nail polish? And one of the fun things with nail polish is that it consists of so many different chemical compounds. Nail polish is made to form a uh, film on nails. And it's got a polymer called nitrocellulose, which is just like starch, but with a lot of nitrate groups attached to it. And it's typically dissolved in a solvent, which is volatile, and will leave behind this polymer film. Plasticizers are typically included to keep the films from being brittle and cracking. Of course, the dibutyl phthalate, phthalates have some toxicity. Um, they are thought to have some problems with the endocrine system, particularly with the development of um, reproductive system. And so uh, there's also dyes and pigments in the nail polish. And these are typically extremely ground fine finely so that they are spread out within the polymer. And one of the uh, properties of this polymer, the nitrocellulose, is that it's not very soluble in water at all, but that the acetone, because the acetone actually has the um, because the acetone has the carbon groups on the end. Let me just pull that up on Wikipedia. So here's the acetone, there's the molecule as a space filling model, and here's the oxygen at the top. And because it's got more carbons on its sides, because this is getting to be a little bit of a larger molecule, it's got stronger dispersion forces, and it's better able to dissolve this nitrocellulose and lift the film from the nails after doing nail polish. Uh, you might say to yourself, well, why not go up and use something more like octanol, well, which has stronger dispersion forces? And you could, but the octanol tends to be a little bit more oily, which is a little bit harder to clean off your skin and your fingers. Um, and because the molecule is bigger, it actually, also actually takes a little bit longer to dissolve the nail polish film than the acetone does. And so while in the long run it might be a more soluble for the nitrocellulose, it takes longer and it's a little bit harder to clean up afterwards, which is one of the reasons why it's not used. So uh, this is the last video for applications of uh, intermolecular forces. Please join us in the discussion to add your thoughts, ask further questions, and join us on Wednesday at 1 p.m for our next class.